you could try and expel people, you could try and remove people, you could start instructing, you could start suspending, you could do all kinds of pretty dictatorial things. Well, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to create a climate of democracy and empowerment. What is the future of the British Labour Party? Well, if you'd asked that question just four years ago, the answer would have looked very different. In 2019, Labour ran on a radical manifesto of leftist policies, expanding the NHS, rehauling the benefits scheme, free transport for students, but also significant foreign policy positions, banning arms sales to Israel and recognizing a Palestinian state. But the devastating election defeat to Boris Johnson would fundamentally transform the party, which shed itself of its socialist image and re-embraced the centrist path of Tony Blair and Blairism under its new leader, Sir Keir Starmer, hoping to capitalize on a chaotic UK government facing turbulent economic and political times. And if the polls are to be believed, it seems like they're well on their way to do just that, after spending 13 years in opposition. So what would the UK look like if Labour got back into power? Welcome to The Big Picture, a show about the past, the present, and the future. My name is Mohammed Hassan, and today we sit down with the man who helped shape that 2019 manifesto, but who now finds himself on the outside looking in. Jeremy Corbyn is the former leader of the Labour Party, who was voted in through a massive influx of new members in 2015. Two years later, he almost clenched the position of Prime Minister in the 2017 elections, but just two years after that, would lead his party into the worst historic defeat at the polls. What happened? Part of the story was an internal rejection of Corbyn and his ideas, which led to a bitter war within the party. Much of it solidified around the anti-Semitism issue, during which Corbyn was accused of failing to address it, and some of his critics going so far as to accuse him of being anti-Semitic, something he, a longtime anti-racist advocate, has of course refuted many times. His allies, meanwhile, say this was merely a cynical tool those in the party who wanted to take him out were happy to use, an issue weaponized to unseat Corbyn and restore the party to its center. In 2020, his successor, Keir Starmer, suspended him from the party, and earlier this year barred him from standing as a Labour candidate in the next election. So what's next for Jeremy Corbyn? And what's next for Labour? Jeremy Corbyn, uh, welcome to The Big Picture. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Pleasure. Very pleased to be here and wonderful to see you. So I wanted to begin by asking you a question about why you first joined uh, the political arena. You began uh, your career uh, in as a unionist, uh, as an anti-war activist. Uh, well, what, much before all that. Much before all that. Well, what, what drew you first to politics and, and what, what did you want to bring to this uh, this area? Looking back on it, I probably grew up in quite a political environment at home, but it never felt like it at the time, because everybody thinks what goes on in their house is the norm to every other house. And um, I remember my mother, uh, when I was doing my homework one night, saying, I've got just the book to answer you need. You need. And she goes off and comes back with something called the Left Book Club, 1930s books that she'd been collecting. And she had. And so she was, mum and dad were very much of the left, but uh, didn't ram it down our throats. I became involved in politics through um, campaign for nuclear disarmament and opposition to the Vietnam War in the 1960s when I was in school. And um, also concerns even then about the environment and destruction of the natural world around where I lived in the country in Shropshire. So all that was a sort of formative to me. And uh, not going to university when I left school was probably a big and actually beneficial factor to me. And I went off to the Caribbean as a volunteer and learnt a great deal there. I'm not sure I taught very much, but I learnt a lot. And you've just celebrated your 40th anniversary as uh, as the Member of Parliament for North Islington. The first 40 years. The first 40 years, exactly. Um, when you first uh, took over that role, what were you hoping to do in Parliament? Well, I was at that time a full-time trade union organiser. I've always been involved in unions and campaigning activities. I was also a member of Haringey Council, local authority. 
And what I hoped to bring to, to it was the voice of the people that I've been elected to represent in Islington, but also to challenge the whole issues of poverty, inequality and injustice in our society and the global hegemony of the power of the Cold War at that time. Now, obviously, things have moved on a great deal from there, but I look back at the speeches I made in the summer of 1983 when I was elected, and I don't feel embarrassed to read them because I stand by everything that I said at that time. So my political views have not particularly changed. Obviously, circumstances have changed. Um, what did I hope to bring to it? I hope a preparedness to challenge our system and challenge the injustice within it and also to try to convert the party, the Labour Party, into something that was more of a community-based function rather than an, just an electoral machine and that I very much tried to do as leader of the party. So was all that successful? Well, I've been there a, a long time. I can't pretend I've loved and enjoyed every single minute of it. There's been some difficult and some horrible times. But at least I've managed to give voice to opposition to nuclear weapons and opposition to successive wars, the Gulf War, the war in Afghanistan, Syria, Libya and Iraq, of course. Is there a particular uh, moment that you are particularly proud of? Taking up cases of um, injustice and denial of justice, such as the Guildford 4 case and the Birmingham 6 cases where Irish people were wrongly, utterly wrongly convicted of crimes in England and imprisoned for life and uh, taking up the cause for their defence and their innocence was very difficult, it was very unpopular with the media and with quite a lot of people in the Labour Party and elsewhere at the time. Nevertheless, the day that uh, all those people, 10 of them, walked free was, to me, a source of great achievement by them and by their communities and began to challenge the way in which um, minority groups, uh, the way in which the poorest in our community suffer worst in the legal justice system. And it's sort of ironic that now there's a question mark over the efficiency of the Criminal Cases Review Board that was only set up as a result of those cases against the miscarriages of justice. And when you entered the Labour Party for the first time uh, in you know the early 80s, what kind of party did you find? What was it like? Well, I joined the Labour Party in 1966 when I was um, 16 and um, in the aftermath of the 1966 election which Labour had won, I was active in supporting the party in that election. It was um, over only a white party, very dominated by men and the conference was a combination of, um, as now, constituency delegates and trade unions it was very authoritarian, the party, in many ways, and the lack of democracy in the party was huge in the sense the parliamentary caucus, the Parliamentary Labour Party, held all the power. And I very rapidly joined the campaign for Labour Party democracy, and I'm pleased to say that over time we did manage to achieve a great deal of change in the democracy of the party, which allowed me to get elected as leader many years later, though that was never the plan. Hmm. And when you did become leader, uh, one of the things that... You know, I think certainly your uh, your supporters were really um, happy with was the fact that you were an outward looking politician. You you kind of you really thought about Britain's role in the world and, and how you wanted it to, to be. Um, where did that come from? Your your outwardness. This this is something that you know, like throughout your career, even when you began, did you get that from your parents as well? I got it from my parents, but also just from life. Uh, when I was in school. Um, I was not academically particularly successful. My mother, who was my greatest defender, said it was all the problem of the examiners reading my handwriting. But apart from that, she was sure all the answers were great. I thought, good try. <laughs> um, but I was always fascinated by the world and by maps and by history as a child. And uh, from that 
became a global interest and also a great interest in the anti-colonial movement and the way in which particularly the African countries achieved their independence in the 50s and 60s, India obviously beforehand, and so the, the power of empire. And living in the Caribbean as a volunteer in the late 60s exposed me to some very good influences in the sense of people like Walter Rodney, who wrote uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, um, and Black History, which was taught at the University of the West Indies. I wasn't a student there, but I w went to various meetings and talks and things and found it absolutely fascinating. And then, completely on my own, travelling around South America, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, um, looking at the... One, the influence of Spanish colonialism, which, after all, those colonies achieved their independence in the 1820s, and the pre-colonial uh, architecture, philosophy and language that was there and is very much still there. And so that gave me a lot of thoughts about how the way empires grow and how the, the way in which empires fall and what's left behind them. So that gave me, if you like, this sort of global view and I was always politically probably more attentive to issues outside Europe and North America than I was in Europe and North America and much greater interest in that so I always try to read widely and travel when I can I've been to probably more than 80 countries in the world in my life I, I don't know I'm not counting but a lot and I find the global political movements fascinating and actually very telling for the future. So the conflict is now going on, for example, in West Africa, which is largely about resources, mm. uranium and oil. Um, obviously the conflicts in the Middle East, but also the global change between the hegemony of the United States and now being challenged by China's economic power which um, a lot of people in the West are very frightened about, say what we need is an assertion of Western leadership in the world. No, maybe we don't need anybody's leadership in the world. Maybe what we need is a, a more powerful United Nations in the world, which gives that forum for people to deal with, obviously, the massive problems this world faces of inequality, of injustice, of environmental degradation. I mean, one of the things that you uh, spoke about uh, in the recent years was, I mean, the war in Ukraine and the and and, and criticizing the the British uh, position on it. Um, that you wanted, or that you would have wanted as leader, to to be able to have a lot more dialogue with uh, with you know your counterpart in Russia. Yeah. Um, what kind of role do you want to see Britain playing? in terms of its foreign policy? Look, let's be clear, the war in uh, Ukraine is wrong and Russia is completely wrong to invade Ukraine. Um, however, isolating Russia isn't going to solve the world's problems. Russia isn't going to disappear or go away. The war in Ukraine is horrible and killing an awful lot of wholly innocent Ukrainians and Russian conscripted soldiers and increasingly Russian civilians. So there has to be a way out of it. Now the time I fought the 2019 election, the war in Ukraine hadn't happened. There was still the conflict in the Donbass and there was still the issue unresolved of recognition of Crimea. My view would have been that the first function we would have performed was to obviously build a relationship with the leadership figures in the, Euro in the European Union, particularly Angela Merkel and uh, President Macron, but also to have a very early visit and meeting with Putin in Russia and, of course, with the USA. There has to be a dialogue in order to try to prevent the wars of the future. There's no point in only dialoguing with people who agree with you. You've got to talk to people who you don't agree with, otherwise you're never going to bring forward a process. During the 2017 election, we had a, a very long session at Chatham House discussing foreign policy and my views on it. I was, I must say, quite sceptical about doing this event at all. And I said to my team, do we really need to do this? It's going to take up half a day of campaigning and also, obviously, time of preparation. But they said, no, no, it, it's going to be good. It's important that you do it because it's important you set out that whilst the election isn't just about um, 
of foreign policy. In fact, it's only a fairly minor part of the political calculus of elections. It's nevertheless very important. And it was fascinating. And people were taking notes of this discussion. And during the discussion, 64 different countries were named during the discussion by me and the person who was interviewing me. So it became a very interesting global discussion about my views as to how you start a foreign policy from a former imperial power, Mm -hmm. which is one about promoting peace, justice and human rights, but also understanding that the refugees come for a reason. The vast numbers come for a reason some economic, some political, some humanitarian, some religious persecution, lots of reasons. But unless you look at the causes of it, and you're just going to end up joining in the disgusting rhetoric that is now the staple of most newspapers in Western Europe, the United States, which is simply attacking refugees for their existence. Mm. And the issue of migrants has really dominated uh, the political cycle for the last couple of months. And the government has really doubled down on its um, perception that uh, of, you know, of having this zero tolerance policy um, towards uh, undocumented refugees coming into the UK. And, you know, the images of the, the, the refugee hotel or the the barge that um, migrants have been have been kept in have filled the news cycle over the last week or so. Uh, how do you feel towards the way that the government's handled migration? Disgusted, utterly disgusted. Those people that are come over from Calais, and I've been to Calais and met people there, and I've met people that are over here. They're poor, often confused often victims of some horrible events in their lives, you or I wouldn't go and get in one of those dinghies and go across the world's busiest shipping lanes unless we were pretty desperate for something. And um, we have to look. There's a human being behind all of those. And then look at the numbers that have died trying to get to uh, out of Morocco and West Africa. Those that are trying to get across the Mediterranean, those that are trying to get across the Aegean, and the numbers who've died. The history of the 21st century is not going to be kind to those politicians that stood back and allowed thousands and thousands and thousands of desperate people to die on our seas and then put forward policies of pushback and denigration of those. Now, of course, asylum is not a solution to everyone's problems. But nobody seeks asylum unless they're desperate for something. Maybe we need to look at the reasons a bit more. And the this prison ship in Portland, I mean, clearly Rishi Sunak and Suella Bravman have not read a lot of history. Otherwise, they would see the irony of um, a prison that was built by French prisoners of war in the 1820s, now as a prison ship moored alongside it which houses people who've committed no crime other than applied for asylum in Britain. Your critiques of uh, the Israeli government um, have been kind of a particular issue that uh, at times has been used by some of your own critics uh, as a way of attacking your policies. But you've been a long uh, member of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. It's where a lot of your supporters know you from. Do you think this critique is fair? Many of the criticisms we've made of me are grotesquely unfair, but uh, I'm a very tolerant, very broad-shouldered person. But uh, I just want to say this, that um, the occupation of the West Bank and the siege of Gaza is appalling. I've been nine times to Israel and Palestine in my life. I've visited many, many parts of the country, prisons and prisoners and so on, and human rights groups in both Palestine and in Israel. And then you sort of think of what it's like to live under occupation. Now, I've never been through that experience. I read a lot about the way in which France was occupied from 1940 to 1944, 39 to 44, and uh, the heroism of the French resistance, ditto Greece, Yugoslavia, and so on a finite period in history. The Palestinian people have been under occupation longer than I've been alive. And uh, to grow up knowing that your journey to school or college will be accompanied by a checkpoint, 
to go to work is several checkpoints. To go out for the evening might be a lot of checkpoints. And to know that your rights to work and so on are very, very limited and your rights of access to your own country are controlled by another country. Well, if occupation is wrong, it's wrong, period. And so surely the basis of the policy demand on Israel has to be end the occupation and end the construction of settlements all across the West Bank. Mm. Your uh, positions were quite clear in your 2019 manifesto that you presented at the election. Um, you uh, wanted to end uh, the sale of arms um, by Britain to Israel. You also wanted to recognize Palestine as a state. How were those policies perceived within the party? Was it difficult trying to sell them? Uh, it's been a long time campaigning to get um, serious debate about the situation facing the Palestinian people and also working with um, groups in Israel who have a similar position on that because Israel is not totally unified on the issue at all. There are many people in Israel that feel extremely uncomfortable about the behavior of their government and their forces in what are now the occupied territories. The debate has gone on a long time in the Labour Party and the first time there was a any kind of change in the policy in the Middle East was actually the 1982 conference after the massacres at the refugee camps in Sabra and Chantilla. Um, and then eventually there was policy passed, which is uh, what was reflected in the manifesto of 2019. I was proud to put that forward on behalf of the Labour Party and to say to all, all of our community, look, wake up. If we're selling arms and these arms are used, then we are complicit in, what, in the way that they use. So let's think about that. And that's why I said we should be suspending arms sales and putting all the diplomatic and other pressures we can um, for the withdrawal of Israeli forces from the West Bank. Was the rest of the party receptive to that? Um, in the parliamentary party, there was the biggest debate about it. Within the Labour Party membership as a whole, much less so. There was much more support for the policies outside of Parliament than there was within Parliament. But that's been the story of my life, that um, support for the policies we put forward on, obviously, Middle East and world affairs, but also on public ownership of utility companies and so on, was always very strong in the community as a whole and amongst party members as a whole. That I always had the greatest problems in persuading the Parliamentary Labour Party of this. And it's kind of fundamental to the politics you started the conversation with, which is the um, undemocratic nature of the Labour Party in the past, which gave too much power to the Parliamentary Caucus. And unfortunately, it's now moving back into that direction again, with the Parliamentary Party being re-empowered at the expense of the wider Labour movement. Let me be very clear about that. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn will not stand for Labour at the next general election as a Labour Party candidate. Uh, what I said about the party changing I meant, and we are not going back, and that is why Jeremy Corbyn will not stand as a Labour candidate at the next general election. Keir Starmer was somebody that you picked in, in your shadow cabinet, Was spent yeah. a couple of years there. Yeah. Did you miscalculate who he was? He was appointed as the shadow Brexit secretary. He, was, um, he had a view on Europe, which is very well known. I knew that before we appointed him, but I felt that he would be... Um, legally very competent in order to negotiate stuff. He and I attended quite a number of meetings in Brussels and other places to discuss Brexit, how it work, and trade agreements and trade arrangements and so on. And at that level, he's very competent. He did not necessarily engage very much in the wider political debate within the shadow cabinet. What I find surprising is that um, he has gone back on... Um, pretty well all of the 10 points he put forward when he presented himself as a candidate for leadership and uh, now seems to be pushing for basically an economic blank check in which um, he accepts the parameters being laid down by the Tory government before agreeing to any new policies. And I was particularly shocked when many of us for years have called for an end to the two-child policy. That's where benefits under universal credit are limited to the first two children in a larger family. 
it would cost £1.4 billion to reinstate the universalism of it. He's refused to do that. Why? It's impoverishing hundreds of thousands of children. He's really positions himself in, in many ways directly in opposition to you and, and, and your time as a leader. How does that feel uh, for you having, you know, this is somebody that you worked with, this is a Labour Party that you have essentially grown up in, to be kind of seen as the, as the polar opposite of what the direction of the party now stands? Well, I, it, it's sad at an individual level for me, but I'm not one that goes around being particularly sad for myself. But what I find um, very annoying is that it is simply the Labour Party moving away from the reality of the politics of this country. The politics of this country over the past uh, three years, four years, have been growth of mass movements in housing demands, in jobs, in health service, in wage levels, think Royal Mail, think Network Rails, and so on, um, and the politics of inclusion and the politics of hope. We managed to increase party membership to 600,000, managed to mobilise a very large number of young people into hope. The most powerful political message is one of hope. If all you're offering to do is continue the status quo and you're living in an overcharged for a private rented flat, you've got a massive university debt, you're not paid particularly well, and you've got no prospect of ever getting a permanent home of your own, you need some hope, and it's not being offered. Do you f regret not fighting harder to stay as leader of, of Labour? It would have been very difficult to carry on as leader after the 2019 e election result. Uh, we had ob obviously lost the election, and uh, at that time, it would have been very, very difficult uh, to, to carry on. We lost on seats more, th more so than on votes, because in fact, um, we got more votes than Labour got in 2005 when they won the general election, but it's the way the electoral system in Britain works. And so um, I regret, obviously, not being able to carry on as leader, but I felt that in all honesty, I couldn't carry on at that point. But even before that, in, in the lead up to it, when it became really obvious to even everyone on the outside that there was a real kind of attempt within the party to try and push you out, um, do you regret not taking some of the measures that Keir Starmer is now taking to try and well, isolate some of the, the critics? Good question. <clears throat> I was elected by party members and union affiliates in 2015. I had... A, a traumatic experience in the shadow cabinet in the autumn of 2015. I then had the coup against me as leader in June 2016. I then had a vote of no confidence by the Parliamentary Labour Party by a huge majority. And uh, the um, leading figures in the Parliamentary Labour Party arrived in my office, stood in a semicircle around my desk, presented me with a piece of paper with the result of the no confidence vote amongst the MPs. And they looked at me like they were expecting me to stand up and thank them, bow and resign and leave out the door. I said, oh, thanks very much, and folded it up and put it in my desk. They said, and? I said, and nothing. I was elected by the members of this party, not by the parliamentary party. They then challenged my leadership, and I was re-elected by a larger majority. And so... It was a quite an important assertion of the democracy of the party, but that, of course, that assertion made enemies as well as friends. And um, now, your question, should I have behaved differently? Well, you could try and expel people, you could try and remove people, you could start instructing, you could start suspending, you could do all kinds of pretty dictatorial things. Well, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to create a climate of democracy and empowerment. I wanted, so I, 
appointed a democracy commission, which Katie Clark MP led, and looked at the whole issues of the lack of democracy. I wanted to promote inclusion and welcoming communities and people into the party, set up community organising as the fundamentals of the party. My whole strategy was one of... My legacy was to be an empowered, more democratic movement that would mobilise communities dealing with the horrors of the economic stress they're going through. Dictators dictate, but then afterwards, if you go down that road, somebody else dictates, maybe the other direction. You haven't empowered people. My whole mission in life has been to empower people. There's been a lot of uh, similarities drawn between uh, you and Senator Bernie Sanders in, in the US. You may or may not agree with them. Um, but certainly with the kind of reaction that uh, Bernie Sanders received from some of the elements uh, within the Democratic Party when he was running for uh, to be candidate. And the analysis uh, of a lot of uh, pundits of sort of the impact of his campaign is that even though he was very clearly not chosen by the Democratic Credit Party, that ultimately he left an imprint on the way that that party had to do its politics. Um, Joe Biden had to implement a lot of policies that that were essentially, you know, Sanders policies. Yeah. Uh, how in what ways do you feel like you've impacted the Labour Party in your time? Very interesting parallel, interesting question. Um, I obviously know Senator Sanders and get on very well with him. And uh, I remember he he called me up just after the 2017 election and it was Sunday night and I was sort of um, two or three days after election I was quite tired I was laying on the settee sort of vaguely watching the television and um, the phone goes oh, it's Bernie here huh? Bernie who? <laughs> and I then woke up and he was here he said oh you run quite a campaign there it was it was great, and then we had a quite a long chat about um, the difficulties both of us had faced with the media, and the difficulties both of us had faced within the structures of our own party. And what Bernie did and does is challenges particularly social inequality in in the USA, and mobilise a lot of young people into political activity. And whenever I've been in the USA, I meet a lot of people that are clearly mobilised by Bernie. And th that is what he continues to do. And I was over in Washington in January to support Julian Assange, and we did a big event at the National Press Club um, in support of Julian Assange, which I think is a key issue. And then I had a very long meeting with Bernie in his office, and we did discuss this issue of economic justice and equality and the problems of the left in challenging that economic conformity, uh, which is, is obviously huge. Now, we put forward in our manifesto public ownership and National Investment Bank. He put forward not so much on public ownership, but quite a lot about in inequality, wage levels and rights at work, and a great deal about investment, hence the um, Biden investment plan, which, uh, as you say, was, was very much got the imprint of Bernie Sanders all over it. And he's now chair of a um, very important committee monitoring a whole lot of things about working time, working relationships and trade union rights. Um, and so my um, activities now are obviously representing my constituency and very proud to do so, and also campaigning with all those unions that are trying to demand at least a catch-up on wages that have been falling for the past 10 years, but above all, empowering people and mobilising communities. And so we're both working in the same direction on that. I also think there has to be um, a much more global view on the left, um, we talked about refugees earlier on, but we all also have got to look at the issue of resources. I mean, look at the war in the Congo. It gets no coverage, no publicity at all. Thousands and thousands of people have been killed by militias acting on behalf of mining companies. Look at the war that's going on in West Papua. Indonesia is occupying West Papua. Why? Because of the natural resources that are there. The dispute in Niger largely about resources. So the left around the world has got to 
obviously get hold of the economic agenda, but also the environmental agenda. We cannot go on having the idea that you will improve the world by greater exploitation of the natural resources and polluting the environment without us all paying a human price for it. And we're paying it now. Where is the left in the UK today? Um, it seems like they've, they've taken quite a, a number of hits recently. There is a Labour Party now that is shifting very visibly towards the centre and away from the left. Where are those voices? Where is that, uh, that wing of politics? Well, that wing of politics is on the streets, in the community, on the picket lines and in the campaigns, um, which gives it far less... Um, focused attention by the media than it would if it was a uh, Labour Party-based and parliamentary-based issue. But I tell you, whatever the result of the next election, the demand of people for decent housing, decent wages and uh, a care system and a health service that is universal are not going to go away. And those political demands will be there. I keep meeting people all around the country who told me that they became active in politics after 2015. Some are active in the Labour Party, some are active elsewhere, but the key is they're all active. And that's what I like about it. And that's why I established the Peace and Justice Project after the uh, 2019 election uh, in order to give a political home to those people. This is not about Jeremy Corbyn as a person. I've no doubt he's someone of deeply held and sincere beliefs who stayed true to them under harsh attack. But politically, people saw him as fundamentally opposing what Britain and Western countries stand for. He personified politically an idea, a brand of quasi-revolutionary socialism, mixing far-left economic policy with deep hostility to Western foreign policy, which never has appealed traditional Labour voters. I suppose on the other end of the spectrum, uh, there's been a real kind of re-emergence of, of Blairism. And, and Tony Blair as a, as a figure um, and a, as a commentator, uh, just recently, uh, Keir Starmer was speaking at Tony Blair's Institute. He was really welcomed by him, thanked him for his guidance and uh, his, his help in, in recent years. There's a real embrace of Tony Blair as a figure again in the Labour Party uh, after maybe a decade or so of, uh, of, of kind of uh, some distance that was put between him. What do you think of that? What do you think of what the, the direction that is the Labour now is going in? I think that the reckoning on Tony Blair, uh, one positive, two negatives. The positive was that he became Prime Minister in 97 and um, spearheaded as much as anybody did spearhead it from outside the peace process in Northern Ireland and we also got minimum wage legislation and human rights legislation through Parliament um, and negatives on Blair were the marketization of public services under him in health and local government which we're still paying the price for and the negative was obviously the war in Iraq uh, which uh, was wholly wrong, was based on completely dishonest supplying of information, which is why I felt the need, I promised I'd do it and did it, to give an apology on behalf of the Labour Party to those people that had suffered because of the Iraq war, those that had died in Iraq, those soldiers that had died on both sides that had died in that war. And um, Tony Blair's institute since then seems to be the most incredibly well-funded institute I've ever seen anywhere. And um, I'm sort of interested as to where all that money's come from. And so uh, I would not embrace the idea of marketization of public services as a way forward. It's marketization of our public services that is destroying them. That's why the health service is now beginning to ration operations. That's why so much money is taken out of the health service by the private sector and out of education by the private sector. We need to evaluate public services for what they are, public services. Services provided free at the point of need, not for the profit of somebody else. If the Labour Party does come back into power at the next election, what kind of government would you like it to be? I would love it to be a government that says, we will raise the minimum wage, we'll make sure that nobody gets less than £15 
an hour. I'd like to see it's a government that embraces the rights of work from day one when you work, the right to join a trade union, the right to be active. I'd like to see a government that takes seriously the issues of climate change and environmental destruction, and above all, about redistribution of wealth and power. Britain has become the most unequal country in Europe. It is becoming worse and worse every day. More billionaires and trillionaires than ever before, and more food banks than ever before. You can't have both. And so I'd like to see a serious and rational relationship with the European Union. Probably the best thing would be a bespoke trading arrangement with the European Union rather than the bureaucracy we have at the present time. But Britain can't turn its back on the, on the rest of the world. We have a declining birth rate and subsequently a falling population. So there has to be immigration in the future in order just to provide the services that are necessary. Mm. We spoke briefly about Israel and Palestine earlier. Uh, and in the last couple of months, there's been a number of uh, efforts by the government to uh, push itself, I, I guess, to for a little bit closer to, to where Israel and the Israeli government wants it to be, specifically with regards to criticism, um, specifically with regards to the BDS campaign, for example, and that was that we saw that with the anti-boycott law. But we also saw a Labour Party that has not really spoken uh, up or pushed back on on any of these measures? We've had a lot of very dangerous pieces of legislation pushed through Parliament in the past couple of years. We've had the uh, anti-boycott bill, the one in law now, which basically is designed to prevent people actively taking an effective role, and it mentions Israel particularly on the face of the bill, which is unusual. We've had the Overseas Operations Bill, which in effect gives the special forces carte blanche to go anywhere. I put forward a War Powers Act which brought all of the armed services under parliamentary authority before they could take action. I thought that was the right way to go um, looking forward. Um, and the Police and Public Order Bill, which is a very serious attack on the right of assembly within our society. And also the um, Employment Bill, which uh, allows a Secretary of State, a government minister, to instruct under legal force people to go to work when they've quite legally taken strike action within the terms of the International Labour Organization. We've, we've become a very illiberal society and it's going in the wrong direction. I would want to see a clear commitment from Labour that we're going to repeal every one of those pieces of legislation. When you uh, meet now with some of those people that uh, that joined the party in 2015, um, specifically some of the people that came from the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, the people that you would that would know you really well, and that really hoping to see a transformation in the way that Britain deals with the Israel-Palestine issue, who now might be worried that some of the activism that they are involved in might be criminalized. Uh, that they might be held, uh, you know, uh, that there might be repercussions for, for that kind of action. Uh, wh what do you tell them? Do, do you feel a sense of responsibility for, for, for the fact that these laws weren't passed? Well, I voted against them all, so I'm not personally responsible for them, obviously. But do I feel a responsibility in the sense of politically? Yes, of course I do, because I didn't want any of those laws passed. And uh, it's my job to try and make sure they weren't passed. Well, sadly, we weren't su successful in that. But I tell you what. When parliaments pass legislation which prevents people from doing things, it doesn't always work. I remember very well the Heath government, Ted Heath government of 1970 to 74. It passed a law about industrial action and said that you couldn't take any sympathetic industrial action to support somebody else. And it ended up with them imprisoning five people who worked on the docks in London for allegedly promoting an illegal strike. Those five dockers were then committed to prison. What happened? Huge strike action all around the country, mass demonstration. What happened? The government sent somebody to the prison to release them. And it's that sort of reaction that I believe will start to develop against um, some of this um, anti-protest legislation. Look, politics is a fluid thing. The rights I have as an MP, indeed my right to vote, wasn't ever given. It came because of the bravery of people at Peterloo in Manchester, 
in 1819. It came from the Chartists. It came from all those people that took action on Red Clydeside in the 1920s. It's lo lots of factors that change politics. Nobody powerful and big in politics is ever going to say, well, we've only run this because there were people protesting on the streets. Not true. How has the poll tax got rid of in Britain? Mass protest. Why is, the right to, why is there a right to roam in the countryside in Britain? Kinder Strout, illegal trespass, 1932. There's a golden thread of protest that brings about change. And some people pay a huge price for that. Those people that have uh, demanded justice for the Palestinian people in Palestine, those people that have stood against colonial oppression in India and in African colonies in the past, Many paid the ultimate price for it, but in the end, freedom was won in their name. Where do you see your role in, in politics now and, and going into the future? I'm very proud to be the MP for Islington North and very happy to continue doing that. My political activities are to support people in the struggle they're doing with the Peace and Justice Project, organising international solidarity um, and support for people around the world in different struggles, but also to try and bring a greater understanding of the possibilities of peace in the world rather than a descent into yet more wars and conflict. And so that means examining what's happening and the possibility of a ceasefire in this terrible conflict between Russia and Ukraine, but also looking at the dangers of war breaking out uh, in West Africa over the um, Western pressure on ECOWAS to invade Niger. Will you stand again? Uh, I'm, if the people of Islington North want me, I'm available for service. As an independent? I'm available for service. And what about uh, the, the prospect of you running for mayor? I'm concentrating on Islington North at the moment. Mm. So that's not something that you're... I'm concentrating on Islington North because that's where my focus is and I'm working very hard on that, but obviously I want to see radical change everywhere. Mm. You want to see radical change in London? Of course. Uh, London has become a deeply unequal city and um, the numbers of people who are homeless is increasing all the time. There are desperate levels of poverty in parts of, of London. There are more food banks than branches of McDonald's and there is desperate hunger around and uh, numbers of children underachieving in school because of poverty is absolutely huge. London needs um, radical changes, many of which can only come by central government policies which will help that. It's not that different to other cities in that sense, but it's more stark in London in that there are enormous levels of wealth in some parts of London. I mean, you see the Lamborghinis and the Ferraris not very far from this studio perambulating around the streets. And you could walk on 15 minutes up to where Grenfell Tower exists and you'll see desperate poverty in the poorest ward in the whole country. That's what London is like. We need to change it. I'm sure there are people that are asking you to run for mayor. Lots of people ask me lots of things all the time. <laughs> Indeed, we had some very interesting conversations on uh, a very delayed tube journey to get here because there was a signalling problem, and so uh, we got involved in lots of conversations with people on the train, which is always interesting and very instructive. Always remember that some of the wisest people are not necessarily government advisors or occupying prestigious chairs in universities. Some of the wisest people are also begging on the street and some of the wisest people are also cleaning our streets. It's important to listen to everybody. It's a great note to end on. Jeremy Corbyn, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure and thank you very much for inviting me on. Thank you for watching this episode of The Big Picture. Thank you to Jeremy Corbyn for being our guest today. Please let us know your thoughts on everything that we discussed throughout this episode and let us know who you'd like us to talk to next. As always, you can find all of our episodes in audio format wherever you get your podcasts from. And until next time, salam.